Okay, um, well, good afternoon everyone. Uh, this is your friend Savage speaking and today we're going to talk about one article, um, the research learning styles and teacher training. And there's a subtitle goes, are we perpetuating neuro neuromyths? Okay, so it's an interesting topic, I have to say first of all, and it was, um, it really appealed to my liking. I did enjoy every single um, letter and word uh, mentioned in the article, so uh, you're going to hear something interesting out of this article. I can tell you. Okay, let's go on. But apparently with the introduction, uh, recent research suggests that brain-based teaching as in the area of, as in the idea of teaching to address perpetual perceptual learning styles has no basis in what scientists are learning about the brain and how it works. So the, the, they, they tried to um, put some um, relationship in between the brain, how it works and the teaching of it and how, how we can um, base teaching to the brain information but apparently there seems to be no connection in between them also with the other study uh, conducted amongst the practicing language teachers um, they wanted to uncover the extent to the extent of um, which they believed so-called neuromyths and whether they worked and how these beliefs uh, particularly in the uh, in the idea that accommodating sensory learning styles improves learning have influenced their teaching so um, Basically, with the learning styles, we thought that the um, learnings uh, were um, apparently um, conducted and accomplished, and this was the common belief in between the in between the researchers. So the article concludes with some recommendations regarding current scientific findings in the area and the language teacher education. Okay. So uh, let's start with the question: What's a neuromyth? Okay. As you know, is the neuro is um, related to the brain, and the myth is the uh, the information which is coming from generations, people's beliefs and people's speculations, if you like. But according to this article, it's been described as misconception, as a, it is as a misconception generated by a misunderstanding or misreading of facts, scientifically established by a brain research to make a case for the use of the brain research in education or other contexts. So. Um, they wanted to um, put a connection between the uh, brain function and how we related to those functions into the teaching or how we related those functions into learning, if you like. But there's a misconception here. I mean, um, especially for those people who believe that the brain has got so much to do with learning abilities, um, there's been a problem. And this is how it's been taught all along, how we learned since the beginning of it. But they, they have found that there were some problems in this belief. Okay, but if you would like to see, if you would like to see some of the examples of the neuromyth, I think there are two good examples I found in the article and I wanted to share them with you. First one is the snake oil sellers are often gifted communicators. I mean, this is one of the beliefs in, um, well, the mutual or called commonly belief in the, in the context of education. So, uh, if, as you know, we always give names to people who are known to be or who are found to be or who are seen to be great learners and we immediately tag them with some kind of um, titles. So, in this case, the first example is a good one. Uh, if you would like to meet, if, if you're meeting a very uh, important um, trader or a seller, um, they always believe that they're good communicators. But if, if, is this the case? Okay. And the next one, as you see on the right hand side, in the right uh, ball, learning is enhanced if people are classified and taught according to their preferred learning styles. Okay, what happened? And what happens is um, people come up to you and t t tell you um, what type of learner you are, and you um, come up with an answer. But in this case, um, apparently, that is again a uh, neuromyth because we believe that we're learning in, in a way that we prefer to, to be or we prefer to do, but that's not always the case. I mean, there are maybe options, there are maybe styles we prefer, uh, but when it comes to learning, when it comes to actual learning, when it comes to actual grasping the information, well, uh, when, you, and when, when you go back and, and um, reconsider about your concept of um, ideology in what you learned it, there is no correlation or no co co communication. Okay. So these are two examples for Neuromyth. And as I mentioned uh, just in the previous slide, learning styles, and as we call them as VAC, um, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learnings. And, and when we walk into a classroom, um, as we all tended to do, like the fir first thing we wanted to see, what type of learners we had. And it's starting with ourselves, actually, as teachers, 
if you if you look at the growth of your the, um, education, this was probably one of the criteria we mentioned. So, what type of learner am I? What turn, what type of learners do I have in my classroom? And what lessons do I have to I have to conduct? What type of adaptations do I have to make? What this learner learn aesthetically? What the other one learn auditorily? Shall I use um, audiolingual concepts or that concepts or this concepts? Well, apparently, losing lots of time in this area uh, is uh, an, an enemy to, to the teachers because, I mean, according to the um, current article I'm uh, sharing with you now, um, it uh, totally suggests there is no connection be, be between these thoughts and the actual teaching and the actual learning. Okay, moving on from this one. Um, so, I think we need to um, look at the um, theory. Okay, and you may say, Savash, okay, you're saying that you know there is no evidence um, uh, as far as the VAC is concerned or the learning styles is concerned. There is no function of the brain here, as you say. But how do you base, um, or where do you base your ideology, or where do you base your information? Well, if you have a look at the screen, um, one of the scholars here, Caulfield in 2004, wanted to have a look into this in detail and just searched on and uh, to tried to evaluate and see the differences between the 13 different models of learning styles. And according to the statistics in his article, uh, learners had to uh, assess themselves with either the questionnaires or the forms of questions that they were given, and they didn't uh, respond to the uh, other type of questionnaire, so there was no communication in between them. So. Uh, Apparently that was one of the um, issues, one of the points where this article is um, formed. So there are two actual criticisms here. The first one is the issue of defining styles. For example, when you walk up to a student and say, how do you learn, if they come up with an answer, and how do, does that answer respond to his actual learning, is one criteria and one criticism. The second one is the relationship between the preferred learning style and actual learning. Okay, if they say, okay, I learn via um, kinesthetic style, and then if you uh, basically are given instruction and see that the learner learned that uh, given a uh, practice, uh, then is this actually what happened over there? I mean, are we going to say that this learner have learned kinesthetically? Okay, and that's the second thing uh, which the um, criteria is based on. So, students here may have uh, preferences on how to learn, but again, according to these articles, I mean, obviously comparing the article with the Caulfield and 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 Ryan and Willingham, there is no specific evidence between these ideal uh, choices of uh, preferred learning styles and the actual learning. So this is how the um, this this new article I'm sharing with you is now generated. So the brain function uh, is a case, but the learning is a case, and when it comes to uh, corresponding these two issues together, we seem to have less and less information and communication between them. Well, actually, there's one more um, article I wanted to share with you, which I didn't put on my slide, but I'm going to tell it to you now. Um, according to another article from um, Krasik in 2006, they again checked uh, the, um, the ideal uh, learning style of the students and they self-reported to the people and they sent questionnaires to the people. But the interesting thing in this article was that according to the results, they found less than 50% agreement between the learner's self-report and their learning style. And or the learning style definition of the questionnaire. Okay, in in one uh, position they um, gave the answers according to the questionnaire, and then in the other part of the questions they put their um, basically um, form of learning styles, and there was no correlation whatsoever between the learning style and the objective test performance in this pure article. And a question came into my mind over here. Um, from our dear Aliyah's teachings, as I mentioned, there, they couldn't find any correlation between the learner style and the objective test performance they conducted in the study. And my question to you would be here now: Which type of correlation do you think they used in this specific article? Okay. If I have to repeat, they couldn't find any correlation between the learner style and the objective test performance, which obviously gave us a strong evidence that there is no communication in between these two issues. I'm asking my dear colleagues over here, which correlation technique did, did, do you think they used in the article? Okay, so now we're basing all these clear facts into our, our practice for this new article. And as we see that there is no correlation between um, the brain system and the teaching and, or, and, teaching and the learning styles. Um, if you come back to, back to our, the present study, they conducted a survey 
uh, amongst 200 teachers in Canada and, and United States and they received 128 answers to, to, the, to their questions and the, it was an, an online cloud system survey they conducted and, and in the survey there were nine statements mainly focusing on learning stuff. Okay, so these neuromits uh, in the um, survey were just number nine as I said and there were these nine different uh, beliefs or the neuromits was sent to the sent to the people to the um, to the participants as a questionnaire. Number one was we mostly use ten percent of our brain. Is it the case? Okay, we're supposed to find neuromits here, ladies and gentlemen. We're supposed to find um, which of these um, options are the um, neuromits. Okay. Number two, individual learner learners show preferences for the mode in which they receive information. Or in our case, VAC. Number three, vigorous exercise can improve mental function. Do you believe it or not? Okay, is it a neuromyth or not? Number four, learning problems associated with developmental differences in brain function cannot be remediated by education. Five, differences in hemispheric dom dominus, dominus, uh, dominance, left-right brain business. Okay, it depends on the which part of the brain takes more uh, shortly. Okay, number six, short bouts of coordination exercises can improve integration of left and right hemispheric brain function. Do you believe it or not? Seven, individuals learn better when they receive information in their preferred learning style. Okay, so I think you've got the answer already. Number eight, teaching to learning style is more important in language learning than in other types of learning. And the last one, extended rehearsal of some mental processes can change the shape and structure of some parts of the brain. Okay, this was a survey sent over to 200 people and they got 120 answers back. But in my question to, to you would be, which one of these do you think are neuromyths? Which one of these do you think are actually happening in the uh, SLA world? Okay, let me go. These one, two, three, four, five, six are the actual neuromyths. Okay, especially for those ones who believe in the epic of we are using 10% of our brains. Well, to be honest with you, this was what I believed so far as well, and funny enough. But apparently, um, according to the um, scientists, we use our 100% of the brain, ladies and gentlemen, not 10%. So that was quite interesting. And learning problems associated with developmental differences in brain function cannot be remediated by education. Okay, so this was another big, big epic or big uh, myth. And the left-hand side, right-hand side problem myth and coordination exercises of the brain is a myth. Individuals learn better when they receive information in the preferred learning style is a big, big, big um, influential myth, if you like. And number eight, which is one of the last myths, um, teaching to learning styles is more important in language learning than other types of learning. So you need to point every single student and to find out what type of learners they are and give the information of the instruction accordingly. This is one another funny, interesting way of teaching language as uh, found to be by the clerks, by the people who did, did, did the researches on this on this area. Okay, well, if we, now from this one, we go and see the results. So, as I repeat, this was the nine uh, questions they raised into their questionnaire, and these are the spotted um, eight neuromyths. And I mean, if you have a look at the numbers, uh, number eight, six, five, and four, and one, you know, is, no, is number one, have a look at the answer. I mean, 30%, more than 30% believe that we use only 10% of our brain. Okay, that's very important. And the highest number, highest percentage is on the 88.028 uh, is coming up with the VAC business, if you like, uh, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learners. Okay, the question is raised saying, which type of learners are you? Okay, if, and correspondingly, they're going, okay, this is one of the types of the learners, and they go, okay, yes, this is very important. We have to apply our lessons accordingly. And very scaringly, 88% of us teachers are believing that this is the case. We have to find what learning style is the correspondent. And you can see the other figures. The second big number is 61.72, coordination exercises. Okay, so brain exercises. People, 65%, sorry, 65% is the second big one. Number five, left and right brain business. Okay, left brain takes information, right brain uses it. Left brain this, right brain that. Left brain emotion, I mean, emotional, right brain, okay, using the information. I don't know. So if you're basing your instructions accordingly with the neuroscientific information we have here, again, you're in the wrong gap, as it says. Okay, so these are the beliefs of the teachers um, for the questionnaires. 
second slide we have a table we have a table here and, and with this one um, the researcher of the article wanted to compare the answers with another research done in 2014 from Howard Jones and wanted to look at the differences and the comparisons between the countries okay our survey number one it says this survey the survey conducted in this research came back with 30% of the belief in 10% usage of the brain. In UK it's 48, in Netherlands it's 46, in Turkey it's 50, in Greece and China so on. Okay, so if you have a look at the um, row number 7, the VAC, um, the Visual Auditory and Kinesthetic Learners, well in Turkey have a look at that guys I mean we all believe that learning and teaching is all depending on the teaching style and the learner style okay so that's a huge wrong again belief amongst us you can um, observe the um, table and there are so many options there the comparisons of the countries well um, basically consequently all the countries have got wrong beliefs and um, neuromods if you like in terms of teacher in terms of language education and learning I'm going to come and come to the end of my um, presentation. What can we do? What shall we do? Okay, there are some conclusions and there are some apparently um, recommendations for the study. First of all, the TESOL training courses may encourage beliefs in neuromids. Okay, so we have to go back to TESOL courses, CELTA courses, DELTA courses, if you like, and if there's any preaching done for the neuromids there. Teachers say that their teaching is influenced by beliefs in neuromids. These are the reports given by the teachers. So um, they believe in the neuromids highly. Teachers also hear and read about neuromids and brain based, uh, based ideas outside of their teaching and training. So apparently the information not only comes with the courses, but they also find out themselves that there is so much correlation and co communication between the brain based ideas and the learning. Teachers should, uh, would like more discussion of brain by uh, based ideas on their TESOL training courses and post training professional developments. Okay. So, on the right hand side, you're going to, you're going to see my um, 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 part, and which I wanted to add on some information according according to me. Well, in my case, I think uh, we should help teachers help each other to read and evaluate more on the scientific research, uh, rather than relying on secondhand information told to us. I mean, okay, um, from the media, if you like, from television, from everywhere of the world. I mean, whenever we connect to the world, we get the information of the brain's factor. Uh, even in the master's um, um, case, when I two years ago we did study some neuroscientific um, studies, and there were so many articles, in, including the information of the importance of brain function. Um, for example, from Chomsky, we know that there is a LAD device, and this, that, the other. I mean, there are so many things that affected the learning. So we have to, uh, rather than okay, um, um, having the structural information formal information um, from the um, books, I think we need to look at the studies more. Secondly, I think we have to be hybrid professionals to encourage the teachers in action to collaborate more with the neuroscience, especially on the ITE. Um, well, th this is also conducted in the survey and then in the study that you know the ITE must be included with the information of the neuroscience and the research. And uh, we need to compare all our um, second language theories uh, systematically with the um, scientific neuroscience people who are dealing in that area and try to see if there's a actual communication connection or not. Okay, well I wanted to um, show you um, and share with you some of the information done in the scientific world regarding the brain function, uh, neuroscience if you like, and the actual learning in the teaching. And I hope you enjoyed it. This was it's now up to 18 minutes now, so I need to end my um, presentation. Thanks very much for joining me. And if you have any comments, please share with me. And seriously, when we come together, I'd like to talk about this more. And maybe we can um, uh, make more, um, you know, uh, comedy con connections and make more um, uh, comments on this matter. Thanks for um, watching again. Thank you very much. Bye bye.